Um, I get to, uh, to talk about abuse and molestation today. Uh, we're going to talk about um, some of the trends we're seeing uh, from a societal standpoint. We're going to talk about some statistics, and then we're going to go over some really good uh, risk manage management solutions for you to help prevent abuse from even occurring within your organization. Now, one thing I want to stress is we're talking about abuse or molestation. Uh, the main focus is obviously going to be sexual abuse. Um, but don't forget that also could include physical abuse and mental abuse, and you'll see some of that peppered throughout the presentation this morning. Uh, but again, the main focus is sexual abuse. <clears throat> One thing I want to talk about um, is uh, you're going to hear me reference an organization called Presidium numerous times today. Uh, so I want to give you a little detail on who Presidium is. Uh, Presidium, they focus 100% on abuse risk management prevention. It's all they've done for over 25 years. Uh, they have over 4,000 clients across numerous diverse industries, including public schools and private schools. Uh, they've completed thousands of root cause analysis. So what that means is they've looked at thousands of abuse incidents. They've reviewed how it happened, how it was allowed to happen, uh, what shortfalls were missing from the program, uh, and they've developed uh, from their proprietary abuse risk management model, which we're going to go over on the next slide. Uh, from there, they've also developed a complete range of risk management solutions. Uh, what Selective Insurance has done is we've partnered with Presidium to really develop um, some free to our policyholders um, risk management policies, procedures, uh, and some additional tools that we'll talk about at the very end of the presentation. All right. <clears throat> I've got a lot to go through today, but feel free to interrupt me with questions. Uh, Presidium operates under the belief that abuse is 100% preventable. Uh, they believe it's, it's developed a, a, based off of a combination of what they have here listed on the safety equation. It's abuse prevention policies, uh, it's screening and selection of not just employees but program volunteers, uh, it's abuse training and that's identification of red flag behavior or uh, uh, changes in a, in a student's behavior, uh, monitoring and supervision, internal feedback systems, consumer participation, how to respond to incidents, and administrative practices. They think all eight of those areas are gonna to equate to an overall safe environment. And you'll see as we go through the presentation, we're not gonna cover every single one of these topics, but we are gonna cover a number of them. <clears throat> so when we talk about at-risk organizations, it's any organization that deals with a disadvantaged population. So when we talk about a disadvantaged population, we're talking about children, we're talking about seniors, somebody with an intellectual or de uh, developmental disability. So of course, that's gonna include your public schools. Uh, it's also gonna include some senior living facilities, child care facilities, and religious organizations, just to name a few. Uh, why is abuse such an issue? Uh, it's obviously something um, that's in the news on, on a pretty regular basis. Um, a lot of this really started with the Me Too movement, which, I, which is kind of ironic in a way, because the Me Too movement, it's not abuse or molestation, it's employee sexual harassment. It involves the employer-to-employee -employee relationship, and that's uh, an employment practices claim, not an abuse of molestation claim. But because of the Me Too movement, more and more people are feeling comfortable uh, coming out and talking about abuse of molestation, and it's even spurned a couple of additional movements um, that are starting to gain in popularity. Uh, one in particular that applies to school, it's called Me Too K-12. Um, it's a movement that encourages students to come out and talk about teachers, coaches, or school administrators that have, have inappropriate contact with the students. Okay? We've seen a huge shift in national youth protection trends. There's a lot more regulation and requirements around protection of children. Uh, this one is important for schools. Uh, over the uh, last five to 10 years, we've seen a 300% increase in child-child um, abuse claims. Um, that's student to student, including uh, physical abuse. Uh, allegations are definitely on the rise. I don't think that comes as any big surprise to anybody. It's in the news on a daily basis, um, including today. Um, I've done this presentation, or a similar presentation, probably uh, several times over the last uh, year. Every time I do, I check the news in the morning to see if there's a story. There's only been one time out of all the presentation I've uh, done where it wasn't a local news story. Uh, today, uh, the national perspective uh, on ESPN, there was a major league baseball player that was arrested for having inappropriate <coughs> contact with a minor. And then here locally, there was a, a teacher uh, out of Peoria, uh, Peoria area, who had moved to Colorado and was arrested in Colorado for having inappropriate contact with the minor. Okay. The one time it wasn't, it was in Chicago. 
it was right after uh, their election, so that's all they were covering. So I think that's why they didn't make it. Uh, from an insurance carrier standpoint, this next one is more of a concern for us. We've seen a huge change in the statute of limitations. Uh, for the longest time, statute of limitations from a criminal and civil standpoint typically ran out when we're talking about minor child abuse at the age of majority, which is 18, plus five years, seven years, 10 years, a lot of it depended on state and the exact situation behind the, uh, the program. The one that uh, states now are going through and quickly adopting new laws and making changes. Uh, the most recent one is the state of New York. Um, they've gone through and they have um, their statute of limitations now for civil cases involving minors is 37 years plus the age of majority. So somebody has up to the age of 55 to come forward and talk about an incident that occurred. Uh, they also pass a common law, and they're not the only state. There are numerous states that are doing this or having discussions about this, where they provide what's called a look back window, kind of like a retrospective look where somebody who at one point did have an incident, but the statute of limitations has run out, they are giving, uh, New York in particular, is giving one year uh, to where those individuals can come forward and bring a claim against that individual. So you have somebody that's 90, and they come forward and talk about something that occurred when they were 16. And again, it's a one year period. The law in New York went into effect in mid-August, and the first day they received over 400 uh, uh, legal filings. So they're changing. Some states have talked about doing two years. Some states um, have done three years. It's, it's all across the board. <clears throat> this next statistic is concerning. I don't have kids, um, but I've got some nieces and nephews. I've got nine. Uh, so I think about them when I think about this. Uh, the statistic is one in four girls and one in six boys, by the time they reach 18, are going to have some kind of inappropriate contact, whether it's online or through a, a, a teacher or a parent um, or a family member of, of, of abuse and molestation some kind of an incident. Uh, this next number, 80% uh, of cases go unreported. Uh, that's an estimate, obviously. Um, the hope is the more we talk about this and the more we pay the, uh, the additional attention and focus to abuse small station, that number will start to come down. And I think that's, I think that's real benefit, obviously. So the question I get a lot is, uh, why don't people report? Uh, typically, there's shame, guilt associated with it. They feel like it's their fault. Uh, they're afraid nobody will believe them. Uh, they may disassociate or they block out uh, the memory of the event. Uh, it's painful, obviously, to recount the experience. Uh, the perp still may be a trusted person within their life. Um, and oftentimes, they're, they're just generally uh, embarrassed about the situation. So what happens to an organization if something goes unreported? If you've got somebody within your organization where they've um, had, had an incident with a minor or child, uh, doesn't get reported, um, that really is going to impact the organization because there's a very, very good chance that, that they will become a repeat offender. Okay. Not an easy topic, I know. Uh, so let's talk about the uh, effects of um, abuse on victims. These are all areas where the victim is going to be impacted negatively. Uh, it's a psychological standpoint, uh, educational, often their grades start to suffer, uh, behavioral, uh, they often start to act out. Um, interpersonal friendships, relationships start to fail, and from a sexual standpoint, they start to act out. Our main focus is always going to be victim first, the, the, the impact of, of abuse on victims, but from your standpoint, it's also important to understand the effects of abuse on your organization. Um, it's a threat to your uh, program's mission. Uh, it can have long-term damage to your reputation, and that's actual events and uh, false allegations. And if I have time at the end, I do want to uh, touch briefly on false allegations as well, because I think that's an important topic. Um, large plaintiff awards, as I mentioned earlier, we're seeing more and more uh, plaintiff awards, higher plaintiff awards. Typically, you're dealing with a very um, sensitive matter, a very disturbing matter, and you've got a very sympathetic plaintiff. Uh, loss of financial resources it could, uh, or services are often jeopardized, and honestly, it could affect your organization's insurability. Uh, it incre uh, when an incident occurs within the organization, you can see a decreased productivity uh, and morale with employees, and you even start to see an increase in employee turnover. Okay. So we really believe abuse prevention is a journey. Um, when I talk to um, uh, clients, prospective clients, insurers, they really fall into one of these three categories. They're either complacent, they're compliant, or they're committed. Uh, when they say they're complacent, typically they'll say, we're a small organization, we know everybody, we're a small community, it'll never happen here. We trust everybody. Um, uh, those uh, 
Organizations typically don't think they need to do background checks. They don't have policies and procedures in place. They just feel like they trust everyone. Uh, honestly, I see that most often with their church organization. I kind of understand that in a way uh, because you know you go to you go to church, they should be God fearing people. So hopefully that, that's something that's not going to occur. But we hear that most often with religious organizations. Uh, the next stage is compliant. This is where somebody has to be licensed through the state. There are state minimum uh, practices they have to follow in order to stay licensed, uh, whether it's background checks or putting some kind of training or annual uh, policy review into place, but they're not committed. They're not passionate about abuse prevention. It's not something they talk about on a routine basis. They don't routinely review their programs and procedures and update them uh, based on trends or, or lessons they've learned throughout the year. The final stage and the stage we're really trying to get everybody moved to is the commitment stage. Um, they're, they're passionate about abuse prevention. They talk about it on a routine basis. Um, and we'll get in, in the next couple slides, we'll get into why that's uh, important as well. So we're talking about abuse prevention policies. Why, why are they critical? Uh, they communicate a culture of zero tolerance that stepping outside of boundaries is not acceptable. It identifies uh, acceptable and unacceptable behaviors. It uh, defines what abuse is and boundaries to operate within. It does not rely on certain individuals. There's not one or two people that are responsible for abuse identification. It's an organization. Everybody within uh, the school district is responsible for it. Uh, uh, it communicates the why behind uh, the policy. It talks about why this policy is important. It includes reporting procedures, and uh, it's reviewed and updated regularly. Uh, the bottom question here, is there an abuse or molestation policy, or is it only an employee sexual harassment policy? That gets into what I was talking about earlier with the Me Too movement. Uh, when we ask people about their abuse or molestation policy, when they share it with us, it's a sexual harassment policy. It doesn't even mention abuse prevention. So policy can help define uh, boundaries within the organization and what is acceptable. You talk about appropriate and inappropriate behaviors. You talk about electronic communication, physical contact, verbal communication, one-on-one uh, -on -one interactions, contact outside the organization, gift giving, and general grooming behaviors. Uh, yes? Can you get into any specifics of this we live in a day and age where everybody, you know, every 10 year old has a cell phone, right? And right. social media and everything else of what you guys are directed in as far as texting and, you know, or being friends with someone on Facebook that's, you know, as teachers or as leaders in our organizations. Yeah, it's tough, especially with schools. Um, if you've got coaches with uh, athletes, I know a lot of times they communicate electronically, um, even with church organizations. Churches, you know, they're, they're, their culture is to encourage community involvement. Um, so with a school district, you know, a couple of examples we'll give is you don't communicate with your personal devices. Everything is done with a school-owned device or through a school uh, email that can be tracked and, and reviewed. Um, from a Facebook standpoint, we just discourage it. Um, or if you do, create a separate account where it doesn't show your personal life and personal activities. A really good friend of mine, she's a teacher. Um, I got a friend request from this person I had never heard of before. When I accepted it, she had changed, she's a teacher and she had changed her name so her students couldn't find her. Okay? I'm just seeing that like, in the church, so I, I share a lot of churches. And I'm, I've noticed a few recently where the youth leaders is texting. Yeah. You know, people, and, and I, I'm glad you brought this up because I just kind of just makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't know that I would be doing that. Yeah, youth counselors, we're, we're going to talk about high risk activities, and youth counselors is definitely a high risk one. And, and it, the, the reason why we say it should be something that the organization can pull up emails or track um, uh, texting communication, or if you do allow personal use of your cell phone from texting, you set very explicit boundaries between what hours you're allowed to communicate with people. Um, but when a, when a false allegation comes in or an allegation is made, it's very easy to pull up all the communication and say, here's everything, and let's review it and go through it. Good question. Uh, so it's important to understand how a perpetrator operates. Uh, they really need three things to, to operate. They need access, they need privacy, and they need control. Access can be done in person or electronically. Privacy, it's one-on-one -on -one or electronically. Uh, from a control standpoint, uh, it's grooming of individuals, testing of boundaries, manipulation, gift giving, uh, or just trying to gain an individual's trust. 
Uh, policies, if they're done properly, can help us act to assist identify red flag behaviors between the uh, access privacy. Screening and selection best practices. This is screening and selection of your employees as well as your volunteers within the organization. It evaluates what level of access to the vulnerable population they're given, encourages applicants and volunteers to self-select now. So what do I mean by that? Um, we had a claim come in where an individual um, was arrested. Uh, he was um, uh, being accused of having inappropriate contact with children. Uh, he was very, surprisingly, very open and frank with the police during the investigation stages. Um, he had said he had gone down the road to an organization. He met with them. They talked about everything they do to prevent abuse from occurring from their organization. They talked about the background checks they do, the uh, employee screening and selection that they do. It deterred him from even applying to that organization. He didn't see that there was an opportunity for him to, uh, to act. Uh, so he went to our insurer down the road who didn't have the same focus on abuse or uh, molestation prevention, and that's where the incident occurred. So if you talk about it up front during your hiring practices, it actually will force some people to self-select out. Another really scary aspect, um, there are uh, websites on the dark web where uh, perpetrators will go and they will discuss soft targets within communities. We'll talk about churches where there's little supervision or there's, there's the opportunity for them to act on, on instances. Good news is the FBI does monitor those websites pretty closely. Uh, it talks about assesses to the exposure, risk the abuse, and who should be screened and how they should be screened. Uh, screening and selection best practices. Um, you get into a standard application that includes a signed code of conduct, uh, look for gaps in employment history or inconsistency. It usually means someone's trying to hide something. Face-to-face um, -face interviews are key. Uh, behavioral interview questions. This, this is really neat to me. So um, uh, with our partnership with Presidium, we've got uh, available to selective insurance. It's called an employee selection screening toolkit. It comes with sample questions you can ask an interviewee um, and sample responses that should send up red flags. It's not going to allow you to identify someone that's actually going to abuse individuals, but if you've got a candidate without red flags and a candidate with red flags and everything else, they're on par, you take the one without the red flags. Okay. Uh, we do highly recommend uh, three professional references and at least three personal references. I get this question a lot. Why are criminal background checks necessary? Why do we need to do and it's kind of a fair question. Something typically is not gonna show up on someone's criminal history unless they've been caught, right? Um, uh, industry and legal standards typically do require it. Uh, you can be held liable as an organization for something you could have known or should have known. It helps keep offenders away. Again, it helps, it, it may encourage someone to opt out. Uh, and, and this number surprised me, 46% of employment, education, and reference uh, checks show some sort of a discrepancy from what the individual is telling. When we're talking about background checks, uh, best practices from where we sit um, is going to include social security number traces, it's going to include the national sex offender search, it's going to include a multi-state criminal database which is like a national search, uh, the FBI fingerprint search is a good way to go as well. And then from a state perspective we like to see county level searches at places they've lived work and attended school in the last seven years or since their uh, last check with your organization. Uh, the question I get a lot is, well, if you're doing the FBI fingerprint check or the national check, wouldn't the state and the local information be included in that? At this point, a lot of systems do not talk to one another. Uh, so there are a lot of potential gaps from, from uh, arrest records and criminal histories. Training best practices. Um, training on prevention and detection uh, of uh, warning signs of abuse, uh, preventing abuse between program participants, that's the abuse between the students, uh, mandated reporting, uh, training on your organization's policies and procedures. Uh, this should be done at the time of hire and repeated annually. Uh, it should also be done prior to access uh, to vulnerable populations to students. Uh, we uh, also recommend that it's done periodically prior to high-risk activities, and we're gonna get into a few examples on the high-risk activities in the, in the next few slides. Uh, what everybody needs to know during the training process, it's how offenders operate. That's the privacy, the access, the control. How to recognize and prevent abuse. 
uh, how to recognize what are high-risk activities, uh, how to prevent false allegations, uh, how to uh, report suspicions and concerns uh, within the organization or external, uh, how to recognize the signs of abuse. Uh, monitoring and supervision, this is what really gets into the access to privacy <coughs> control. It decreases the opportunity for privacy, uh, protects youth and monitors the high-risk activities, uh, manage and monitor the facilities themselves, and supervising the employees and the volunteers. So let's talk about high-risk activities. Um, these are high-risk activities across all organizations. It just so happens that your school districts are going to have a lot of these present. Um, it's overnight trips. So it's that you know you're taking the eighth grade uh, class to Washington D.C. for you know a couple of days with an overnight stay. Um, it's that the cross country team that's going to state finals and having to do an overnight stay. Uh, we also say anytime water is you get water involved in, in, in one way or another, that's a high risk activity. That's bathrooms, locker rooms, or any kind of an aquatic center. Uh, personal care, you're not going to see that with the public school. Uh, transportation, you'll definitely see that. School buses, back to school buses. Uh, periods of transition, so that's transitioning um, uh, from class to class um, or transitioning to lunch. That's the, the free period of time where they're, they're moving um, uh, pretty much unsupervised a lot of times. Uh, anytime you get mixed age groups together, I don't think you're going to see that too often with the public schools. Usually the elementary, junior, high school are all separate. You don't see a lot of commingling of age groups. And then youth counselors, um, like we mentioned earlier, you're not going to see those on public schools. <coughs> Best practices on the transportation piece of it. There's a lot of schools, some in here, that they're just <coughs> financial standpoint and uh, I guess the schedule and structure of their routes, etc., will sometimes need to have uh, single students transport to different schools for various reasons, maybe special ed, whatever. So, do you have some guidelines or thoughts on that? Yeah, and anything you can do there, so um, whether it is internal cameras within the vehicles to monitor things that occur, that, and just so you know, if you've got cameras in the vehicle, that's not going to stop something from happening. It just helps with the investigation afterward. We've seen numerous claims where they've got cameras and that does not stop people. Um, GPS on vehicles, um, we offer a product called Selective Drive. That, um, it's free, they can plug in the vehicle, you can track where it's going, if it's stopped, um, uh, what, whatever driving habits, so that's a useful tool. Um, if you um, it can eliminate that at all, whether you've got two people in a vehicle at one time, that's a big deterrent, two staff members in a vehicle at one time. So there's, there's a few different ways you can, you can always help mitigate the risk of the Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so high risk architectural areas. Uh, this is something that I didn't think about, but it, it applies pretty heavily to your, your school districts. Um, it's isolated areas and rooms. So those are things like stairwells. Um, another big area that we've seen is if you've got a, uh, a theater area um, where the doors are kept closed or the stage curtain is kept lower, kids will get behind there and incidents will happen. Uh, playgrounds, rooms without windows. And I will say it's actually rooms with windows too because you'll have some teachers, especially like elementary, where they'll put pictures in the windows and when the door's closed, you can't see in the room. Um, we've seen incidents where teachers will leave kids alone in a room with and without windows, whether the windows are covered and incidents will happen. Uh, bathrooms and locker rooms, I think that kind of goes back to what we were talking about a couple slides ago. Uh, residential spaces, outdoor wilderness areas, so certainly this is very good coming to play in the school districts. Can you just say in general, if and one adult is never alone with one kid, yes. that's never happens, right? Yes, say never, but it definitely yes. reduces it. Definitely reduces it. The only time it would is if you get people that are walking together. So it doesn't happen very often. And actually, that, I've got, so what, uh, when we talk about, uh, if I've got time at the end with the false allegation, I've got to get where that goes with that. Incident reporting and responding. Uh, how do you respond to red flag behaviors? Those are behaviors that are outside. If you've got a, a, a well-detailed policy procedure, behaviors that fall outside of that, those are red flag behaviors. How do you respond to those? Uh, this one is really important, and this uh, this next one to me is when an organization is really committed about it. How do you treat near misses um, as free lessons? So that is if um, you know you see you're not allowed to have one-on-one -on -one contact behind the door with a, a student. You always have to have two people, three total people in the room. Um, someone uh, goes beyond that. Uh, they thought it'd be a short meeting. It turns into be a longer one. 
Another employee sees it, they report it. Uh, nothing occurred, there's no allegation made by that individual. You need to treat that as a free lesson to talk about why that's important that you don't do that and what could have happened even with a false allegation. Uh, be consistent in your approach, use a continuum of responses, and have written procedures in place. Uh, overall, the prevention efforts that help influence the risk is your criminal background checks, the reference checks, the abuse prevention training, uh, uh, supervision requirements, Board involvement and board awareness is really key as well, because typically a lot of this stuff will, will feed from the top down. Uh, has to be a culture of commitment that includes written procedures for reporting and responding, written policies including uh, acceptable boundaries, and written procedures for high risk activities. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, Selective is partnered with um, Presidium to provide a lot of really good risk management tools and resources free of charge to our insurers. They include the employee, the volunteer selection uh, and screening toolkit I referenced earlier. It includes discounted background checks. I don't think that's as important for this group, um, just because everything I know about the state of Illinois and what's required of teachers, um, I think that there's a lot of really good stuff there that you've got additional uh, other resources for. Uh, we have a program, it's called Armidus Online Training. Um, it's annual training. There's uh, 12 to 15 various topics out there about abuse prevention and identification. Uh, your school district can actually assign an administrator to run the program, and they can assign different videos out to teachers, volunteers, uh, coaches, and you can keep track of who's completed them, uh, what, how they did from a, from a score standpoint, and you can assign new videos to them. And uh, a lot of people have been using those um, to, to supplement the annual training on abuse. Uh, we also have a sample model policy and procedure. So this document um, it, it's been beneficial to uh, pretty much anyone we've worked with. Somebody that doesn't have any kind of a model policy, abuse prevention policy in place, they can take it and plug it and implement it and use it within the organization. We've also have had some that they've not updated the program in a number of years. They've taken bits and pieces out of it to where they thought that there was benefit and they could update it. Uh, we've also had uh, clients that we've worked with when we review the prevention policy. From our standpoint, they've already got a really strong prevention policy in place. After they review that document, they go through and pull bits and pieces out of it still. So it's an important one if you're in selective insured to, 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 to go online. Uh, the landing page is listed there. It's www.selective.com backslash training. I always forget the back and the forward slash. Uh, Presidium, uh, and, and it should be in the PowerPoint as well. All right. I'll piggyback on that a little bit. This is uh, this is new with with selective even to us at Unwind, but I had a church that is now using your services and are very pleased with it. So if you are with selective and want to know more about it after the day, get in touch with any of us and we'll help you get to that website as well. But there, there's a lot of valuable stuff out out there that is offered. A lot of it offered free to selective insurance. Any other questions? I take a minute, do I have a minute to talk about the Absolutely. false allegations? Yes. All right. False allegations, I think, um, are just important to your organization as actual abuse incidents. Um, Presidium has shared with us uh, several times where um, they have they've worked with a, an organization. They will put very specific boundaries in place. Um, but the one I want to use is the one-on-one -on -one contact behind closed doors. There was an organization, they had very strict guidelines, and there always had to be two people present anytime they were meeting behind closed doors with a program participant or an individual. Um, they, uh, they were working with one uh, girl in particular that had um, some behavioral issues. She said she didn't feel comfortable with meeting with multiple people, so one individual in particular um, started meeting with her behind closed doors. People noticed this, people didn't say anything about it, um, they didn't think much of it. Um, it's, it continued on a regular basis. Eventually an allegation came out against that individual from the girl. Uh, that's the story that made the news. Uh, this individual was um, investigated by police. When they asked, you know, hey, the, the, your, your organization has a policy against, strictly against meeting behind closed doors one-on-one. -on -one. Why have you been doing this? Uh, they start talking to other employees. They say, yeah, it is kind of weird now that you mention it, that he was meeting with people and you know, we've got a policy against it. Months go by, eventually the girl admits she made it up, um, it was a false allegation. That is not the story that makes the news. It's, it's the initial news, the initial story. So it's a really good example of why it's so important when you put these programs and procedures in place to make sure the organization is following it. Not only for the false allegation, but if eventually it got to the point where they were grooming and something could happen. Well, within these schools, there's 
districts, I know, especially getting to the high school level, you got all these teachers that offer come in early if you need extra help, things like that. So those are situations where they're often one on one. I mean, is it, is it just you know, as far as what they should do, just ensure that it's an open door situation, or should they actually plan on having more than one person in there? Yeah. So there's a couple things you can do. Open doors always are highly recommended. Um, there are certain sins, instances where you're not going to be able to do that, you know, from a privacy standpoint, whether you're as a counselor meeting with a kid. Uh, a couple things you can do is um, you can say, hey, these are set office hours, and then you can assign an employee that just randomly makes rounds and pops in and just checks, you know, I can knock on the way out, everything's going, is everything going okay in here? Or you do the beat behind um, a window glass um, or uh, doors with uh, windows and open doors. There's definitely some instances you're just not going to be able to get around it. It's, what do you do to counteract that that additional exposure? So, in a lot of schools, and a lot of the administrators here see this, going mostly in high schools, but I guess it could happen in middle schools. There's a relationship between kids. Yes. At what point in time does it become something that they need to address with um, students, parents, etc.? Does this happen before where? They allegedly knew stuff was going on between the kids that were doing the and So it developed into something else where <coughs> then uh, they break up and one's harassed the other and it becomes uncomfortable and they have to go to the district, et cetera. And that, that's when suits happen and said, You knew right. about this, you didn't know about it. What, at what point in time does the administrator step in? Yeah, it's a, that's a really good question, and it's honestly it's a, it's a difficult one to answer. So um, when you go through and start doing the training, they'll, they'll give you warning signs on things to look for, so it's typically behavioral changes. Uh, so if you suspect something, or if another student comes to you to say, hey, I think something is going on, that's when you need to step in. The number one reason for verdicts against organizations is negligent supervision. So it's failure when you know something's going on, or you're, somebody brings something to your attention and you don't respond, and they'll do anything about it. So that's a tough one. Yes. Kind of on that note, um, in the aftermath that you know something like this has been reported, of course there's a magnifying glass and yeah. there's follow-on things. How is the school district to um, respond to follow-on things that may not be substantial, uh, clearly defined? Here's the example. You know, someone voices a concern about a staff member that may look at kids inappropriately. Because, you know, we hesitate to bring someone on in and need to do an investigation because it's, it's a, what is your guidance on something like uh, that? that? That's tough and it's gonna vary by situation. Um, so that, that's, you know, it, this stuff is not easy to talk about. And the incident I gave earlier with the false allegation People saw something going on that was outside of the policies, but people are afraid to come forward and say, you know, hey, I think we're doing something behind closed doors because nobody wants to call somebody else an abuser. Um, so it's just it's just a matter of building that culture within your organization that if you see something, let's talk about it. It's probably nothing, but let's sit down as a group, let's talk about it, let's review it, and um, it, it, maybe you use that as a learning opportunity to say, um, okay, based off of this, here's what we need to do to adjust our, our, our policies and our procedures. One of the videos, it's actually kind of, uh, you, you'll see the list of some of the videos in here. Um, but that one of them uh, that was really interesting for me was uh, the one that's called Meet Sam. It actually gives you pictures of four or five individuals and you're supposed to guess which one is the, um, the abuser. And you know they try to make some of them look creepy, they try to make some of them look normal. But when you go through and click on them, they, I mean, it could, it could be anyone. You never know what you're based off of looking at someone. Okay. Any other questions? All right, appreciate your time on a difficult topic. And uh, if you have any questions, let's add this to you now and then we'll work on it. All right, we'll take a 10-minute we'll break. Um, and then we'll